Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to, as Stephanie said, this first session about Basel Hong Kong Conversations, which is in collaboration with the Global Art Forum uh, that I'm Commissioner of. Uh, and this year it's called Predicting the Present. Um, and so that's going to uh, have a kind of impact on the shape of the conversation that we're about to have. I want to start by thanking Stephanie uh, and also Apurva for the invitation and putting the session together, as well as my team at Art Dubai, that includes Benny, Fatima and Verona. So if the title of this uh, discussion seems uh, a little sensational, well, it's because we live in undeniably sensational times where nuance is equated with si with silence and algorithms are trained on maximum social friction. If you want to know uh, that I'm verified, you will have to pay $11.99 a month for that privilege. Therefore, if you happened to start paying attention to NFTs and the broader crypto ecosystem at the time that Beeple's first 5,000 days sold at Christie's on the 21st of February, 2021, you may feel like you saw the giddy rise and fall of a neo-tulip boom and bust. It isn't just, uh, isn't it just a desolate nothingness now with celebrities being sued for shilling over inflated trash and scammer CEOs either jailed or on bail at their parents' luxury mansion. Early technologies are inextricable from speculative volatility. If the macro economy catches a cold, then crypto markets are sent to A&E and NFTs fall into a deep coma, supposedly. As every crypto YouTuber will say at some point in their storied career, if in doubt, zoom out. And when we do zoom out, we realize that everything has been, is, and will be narratives. As Web3 style, uh, self styled idiot savant Kobe put it in a piece called Trading the Meta Game, quote, participating in crypto markets during the thrill stages of a bull run is isomorphically more similar to playing a modern video game than it is to investing. Most competitive modern video games have an ever evolving meta game. The meta game can be described as a subset of the game's basic strategy and rules, which is required to play the game at a high level, end quote. Or uh, as trend analyst Sean Monahan put it also later uh, in 2022, quote, most people want to make crypto a story about technology or a story about culture. But reminiscing, I think crypto is a story about power. They say politics is downstream of culture, but you know what is upstream of culture? Power, end quote. So my four uh, esteemed uh, venerable guests today each bring a very different POV from the front lines of what is still happening, even as the tabloid headlines have moved elsewhere. Another uplifting cliche is that unicorn companies are built during bear markets, not bull markets. But so too are infrastructures, audiences, and also wider understanding. You could call it nuance. So at this point, um, I would uh, really love it for uh, my guests to briefly introduce themselves and, um, but also uh, tell us, uh, it's a question I like to uh, ask everybody who's involved in the space, which is when did you get involved in the space and what was that sort of magical moment that, that drew you in? So uh, if I could start with Peter first. Uh, Peter, tell us about yourself. Hello from Hong Kong. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, my name Pleasure. is Peter, um, co-founder of ScreenScrew.io. We used to be a semi-full-fledged marketplace, but we have recently been reincarnated as a cultural think tank focusing in the intersection of art and tech. Uh, with our, thankfully, with our network of artists, creators, uh, collectors, and institution partners, we're investigating the identity of different art, tech, and cultural phenomenon through the eyes of the greater art ecosystem. There's so much changes, and the velocity of innovation is so fast. I think there's a moment that we need to sort of stop, maybe a little bit, um, look at what we are working with before we engage any further. Thank you, amazing. And Peter, how long have you been in the space? What was that? Uh, what was that entry point for you in terms of crypto? No, I I can call myself a cultural technical enthusiast. Whenever something mm -hmm. pops up, 
um, before it is version one, I'm always beta testing. So we were working with a bunch of um, techies, uh, doing a lot of authentication work, conversion work, and understanding the space. And then we sort of like wanted to um, look at the marketplace with a different angle, because at the time it was more or less pop art, and we were trying to bring more of the fine art constituent into the marketplace. Um, it's a hard journey. Um, there were different paths developed throughout that process. And the artists that we work with have different sort of like um, path that they followed. And um, at this, uh, uh, starting about two months back, and we were thinking, uh, before moving any further, not just because we're clipped to winter, we really need to be more understanding and more uh, understand of what actually the whole space is and what is the technology behind it. Um, that's why we're turning ourselves into a think tank. Um, soliciting opinion ideas from different walks of life, um, especially people like yourself. Um, we want to sort of step back a little bit, look at the whole big picture in a more macro way, and then we zoom in again later on. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, MP, who are you? Uh, that's a very hard question. Do I know Biggest who I am anymore? Question. This time in the morning, I know. Go. Wow. Um, I'm Maria Paula. I'm Argentinian, but I've been living in Berlin for 10 years now. And uh, I am the co-founder at JPEG. JPEG is basically your uh, favorite neighborhood cultural infrastructure provider for Web3. And that essentially means that we're building a set of tools and platforms to allow people to experience um, NFTs, uh, like long tail NFTs and understand the context and the historicity and uh, everything that aligns with cultural value of NFTs. Mm -hmm. Without, of course, leaving aside the fact that we're tied to a market. Um, a JPEG, we say basically, you know, it's like when you're meditating, that a, a thought a pops in your head and you have to assume that it's there and, a, and live with it. Well, I assume that the market is there and I actually live with it. You know, I'm not a, denying that NFTs are extremely versatile assets, that they're both financial, cultural, they can be many things. I think it's great. And uh, I think that, you know, the understanding, uh, so, you know, back to JPEG, JPEG builds cultural infrastructure with us, the, mm -hmm. this I mean right now. Uh, we have two products at the moment, uh, and, you know, more will come soon. Um, one is the exhibitions. Uh, people can basically log into our platform. It's open for everyone and create exhibitions regardless of the ownership of the token, because we believe that art should be permissionless. Uh, and mm -hmm. we build, you know, infrastructure that's situated uh, around the base uh, core tenets of Web3, which is uh, permissionlessness, decentralization, uh, trustless, uh, trustworthiness, um, and censorship resistance. And then we have another product, which is very exciting right now. It, uh, it's very, it's very trendy, and uh, it's called Canons. And, and mm -hmm. through the Canons, uh, we build with alongside with the community a taxonomy of NFTs that's allowing people to understand better um, what you know are the NFTs they are collecting, in which context they're situated in. Um, everything is recorded on chain. We are with. So we're also generating a history of provenance and more to come. And uh, yeah. to your question, um, when did I start? Uh, mm -hmm. I started in 2017. Um, mm -hmm. I was, uh, I actually came across NFTs um, in the first grant giving ceremony that included NFTs. I met uh, one of the, you know, grandfathers of NFTs at, uh, very poetically, at the same hotel as uh, Lost in Tokyo. Um, mm. <laughs> and I learned about NFTs in this hallway. Um, I was taken, I thought it was a fantastic case for provenance. Um, mm -hmm. I started working on them right away. I am also the co-founder of a nonprofit that's called Department of Centralization. So uh, that runs events, including East Berlin in Berlin. So I could immediately put into practice everything that I was learning, published two papers on the matter. And uh, yeah, uh, when the NFT boom came around, I was actually finishing up the second paper, had a lot of trouble updating it, realized that there was a market opportunity. 
And I decided mm-hmm. to take all the knowledge and, you know, do something useful. Um, so that's when I started JPEG with some Spike and Trent Elmer two years ago. Okay. Thank you so much, JPEG. And we'll, we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail soon. Clara, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, introduce yourself to our audience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and for having me. Um, so I'm a curator. I uh, write a little on the side. I'm based in Singapore. Um, and I've always kind of been interested in the intersections of, I guess, art and money. Just very curious about the art market, how it works, how art and money is extremely linked um, in the entire system, um, and how artists are also working with emerging technologies and how finance and the market have a lot to do with those different areas. Um, so I kind of first came into the NFT space. Well, I first heard about NFTs uh, much later um, in 2020. Um, someone was showing me their crypto kitty on their phone and told me, oh, we're selling art, you know, on our phones. And I was kind of like, that's really great for you. Um, but I wasn't so into, I didn't think I could get into crypto and blockchain. Um, and only in 2021, kind of very early, I was asked to write a piece about NFTs in Southeast Asia and to sort of understand what's kind of going on. Um, and so it led me down this rabbit hole of actually then, you know, confronting what's going on and trying to understand how blockchain is developing and how artists are building on top and around this area. Um, and also then connecting with um, artists such as Siobhan, whom I think is uh, listening right now. John, Speak Cryptic, um, Ernest, who are all based in Singapore, and realizing that there were a lot of artists kind of in the Southeast Asia region that were trying to learn more about NFTs, trying to see, you know, a way of financial independence, uh, financial freedom, or put their work out there through a different audience and seek more support for new media practices. But we were really struggling with sort of geographic um, specific questions like, you know, access or where do you go to buy your Ethereum to mint? Um, and so realizing that we need a kind of platforms and channels for artists of different parts of the world to then come together, share space um, and get to know about the space together. Um, and so that's when we created NFT Asia. Um, so mm-hmm. we started in March 2021 and it's become one of the bigger uh, kind of artist collectives in the space. Um, we remain a nonprofit. Uh, we have actively chosen not to become a DAO. Um, and our mission or focus has always been to support Asian or Asia-based artists um, in this space. And we do that through sort of three main areas. The first is really mutual sharing and skills building. Um, so keeping in mind that a lot of the artists that come into the NFT space, you know, haven't been sort of career artists or don't have access to ecosystems and infrastructures that support sort of this becoming of an artist. So that's things like how do you write, you know, your artist bio? How do you talk about yourself and your work? Um, how do you protect yourself against certain practices in the space, especially when you have so many platforms or organizers that are also learning to work with artists for the first time? A second area that we focus on is really creating opportunities and connections, kind of acknowledging that as much as, you know, we hope for Web3 to be borderless and globally connected, um, that's just not the case, right? There is a lot of infrastructural access things that, you know, we haven't addressed. Um, And so through this collective platform that we have with NFT Asia, trying our best to see in ways, you know, what ways can we then support artists um, to have access to different opportunities, exhibitions, showcases um, as much as we can. And the third is something that we sort of start thinking about more recently, and that is, you know, recognizing that there's this huge rush to really historicize and, you know, build narratives around um, NFT is an art and sort of, you know, I think as um, JPEG is thinking about canons, right, of like what is art on the blockchain and wanting to sort of try as best as we can to make sure that Asian artists um, are not going to be written out of those narratives, very much still recognizing that you know, there are certain networks and communities closer to these groups uh, which are able to sort of do this work of canonizing and historicizing um, and how often those are concentrated in certain cities or parts of the world um, and hoping to close some of those gaps. So, yeah. Thank, that's you. Really Thank you so much. That's great. 
And, and Chris, last certainly but not least, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into the space. Hi everyone, I'm Chris. Um, I would say I do a little bit of design, uh, more recently with some curation. I used to do some uh, program, uh, program management with Tropical Features. So it's basically, I'm the founder of Tropical Features. It's a space, uh, used to have, we used to have a space in the Philippines, a uh, cultural space that, you know, we would program anything from uh, music shows, new media shows, group shows, to more traditional uh, art shows. Um, and then we'd also host a residency. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, it's transformed more into sort of uh, a studio of sorts. Uh, where we're engaging in anything from last year, uh, we were the inaugural curator for Art Dubai. We did some work with Art for Philippines for their NFT and digital section. Um, and then now, exper you know, going back into some more transdisciplinary projects uh, related to, um, you know, related to the tropic. So I'm working on uh, a music project actually with the artist Obese Dogma 777. And we're looking at Baduts, which is like sort of a, a grassroots electronic music genre um, and basically creating like hybridizations of that and then doing some work with uh, there's this one brand denim tears so we're doing a some uh, fashion design collabs with them and then currently uh, working uh, have the pleasure of working with uh, Clara and Schumann um, for Art Dubai um, and then I would say in terms of how I got into crypto uh, it was actually quite, I guess, 2014, 2015, I was doing early work on mesh networks in New York City. So there was a mesh network in New York called NYC Mesh. And I was doing a lot more educational, like soft infrastructure work on seeing like who's behind these mesh networks and how these networks sustain themselves. And when you Google decentralized network, enough Bitcoin eventually comes up. And I was like, what's this? Um, and, you know, I, I would say uh, from there became, you know, a little bit of hodler and well, not actually not hodler because I sold to pay for a vacation a few years later. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, like 2017 got, we got, I, I guess, like got more into it, reading all the vaporware, sci-fi, white papers, doing some shitcoin mining. Um and then this last uh, this last cycle was great because I finally got to merge these two identities I have, um, which is more like this one tech side and this um, more cultural side um, with NFTs. And it was really because I have this sort of uh, troll Instagram name called BJ Blockchain Algorithms. And uh, the director of Art Fair Philippines was like, hey, do you know anything about NFTs? This was like in uh, like late 2020. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. So. It, that sort of like pulled me in and I was like, um, you know, sort of bridging these two worlds and, uh, you know, sharing that information with friends and artists that are, were interested in the space. And that eventually led me uh, to doing, you know, work with Art Dubai Digital last year. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and then, you know, here we are today just lurking on Discord and Twitter and, you know, trying to stay abreast with things. Amazing. Um, thank you all so much. Um, I'm just gonna, I'm going to slightly de derail the the sequence. I know you've all prepared some slides, but uh, you've all sort of brought things up that I, I actually want to get to a, a lot a lot sort of sooner than than I planned perhaps. But one of um, you know one of the things I'm, I'm really keen to get your uh, opinion, your take on is um, something you know I would call institutional endorsement. And, um, you know, so just over a week ago, we saw the Santo Pompidou announce its first acquisition of 18 NFT based works uh, that will enter specifically. And I think it's very interesting. The new media department permanent collection. Um, uh, there's a show that will uh, that will follow uh, soon on um, almost at the same time. I think over last weekend, there was news that LACMA in Los Angeles accepted a donation of 22 generative uh, NFT works uh, from the collector Cosmo de Medici. Um, and uh, LACMA is also staging, I think, a really important show. I really would like to make my way over there called 
uh, enters the computer age, 1952 to 1982. Um, and I actually had the pleasure of an amazing call with Lynn Hirschman Leeson uh, last week. You know, and it, you just, you know, you speak to somebody like that and you realize how, you know, how much um, uh, intentional uh, blindness there was towards digital art for decades. Um, and now there's a sort of maybe finally a sense of wanting to catch up. Um, but that wasn't necessarily there when it was happening, you know, when someone like Lynn was producing work in the late 60s and 70s. Um, and, and so we're going to see, you know, and we've already seen, I mean, it's, it's already been the case, but, um, but traditional legacy institutions are entering into the fray. They're going to be offering maybe more scholarship, more context building. And of course, you know, Art Basel uh, and Art Dubai have foregrounded these activities and these markets. So I want to ask each of you about your opinions regarding the sort of legitimization of digital and NFT art by legacy institutions. Because, you know, again, on uh, certainly on crypto Twitter, it's a very heated and contested topic. Uh, you know, many people would assume that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's it would be universally um, well received, but that isn't necessarily always the case. Um, so uh, perhaps, Clara, I would like to start with you about uh, how do you how do you feel about this recent uh, kind of legacy uh, legitimization of, of NFT work? Yeah, um, I think before sort of responding directly to that question, I just want to backtrack a little and say that I'm of the opinion that, you know, most of the times when we're looking at works um, that are minted at NFTs, there is this important distinction of what is on-chain, um, mm -hmm. sort of fully on-chain artworks um, versus sort of artworks that are then minted on the blockchain. And oftentimes when you really boil down to it, um, you know, works that are NFTs are not always necessarily so different from just digital and new media work in general, um, which, mm -hmm. as you pointed out, has been around for decades and, you know, it mm -hmm. rightly deserves more institutional support and scholarship. Um, and I am of the opinion that if there were more sort of spaces um, with sort of resources as well as certain kind of networks and eyes um, that could give more consideration, especially, you know, of longer form kind of discourse or narrative building to the space, um, one that is currently rather market oriented um, and very um, sub much subjected to kind of the ups and downs of the market. Um, that overall the kind of like crypto art ecosystem or just the blockchain ecosystem could benefit, um, bring closer to wider cultural discourse, but also that it's important to sort of stop and ask ourselves, you know, because it also seems like not just in the institutional collection side, but in just, for example, your Sotheby's and let, you know, Chrissy's working together with NFT collectives or platforms and bringing artists into the space. Um, and the fact that a lot of artists have been very open to being a part of these sales, um, does it, you know, sort of signal that eventually all of these different ecosystems are just going to merge. Um, and mm -hmm. if so, then what happens to some of the openness and decentralization, that shifting of power that you were speaking about earlier, um, that, you know, so many of us came into the space seeking? Yeah. And uh, MP, I mean, as you mentioned, you're, one of your uh, major initiatives at JPEG is called Canon. Uh, and so could you, yeah, could you, could you tell us how, how do you feel about, because there's a sense in which, you know, uh, I mean, some of the work, a, a research initiative that you and Stina Dea uh, and uh, I think Chris Tara, you know, put together at Berlin uh, recently, you know, attempting to sort of historicize mm -hmm. the, let's say the Berlin scene. And, um, and the interesting thing is, even though, you know, um, these technologies and these cultures are uh, certainly in the span of, let's say, art history, relatively short. They still have histories. No, there are still kind of canons. There are still pioneers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. How do you feel about this this recent um, intra institutional interest uh, and ad admitting works into permanent collections? Um, so. 
you know, the first thing to understand, obviously, like the use of uh, cannons in my product is mm -hmm. ironic in a way. It's tongue in cheek. <laughs> um, I I do believe that uh, you know the like the, there is a new art world brewing in Web three. And I also believe mm -hmm. that uh, there is a new awareness from institutions that want to, you know, get like genuinely um, accustomed and they want to be genuinely in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that, uh, you know, and these these attempts uh, for in, in specifically the, the Pompidou attempt feels legit. Um, I don't know about the other one. Uh, we can discuss it later um, as well. Um, I feel that, uh, you know, with respect to the other one and the claims that have been made that were ahistorical and disingenuous, mm -hmm. uh, that makes me a little bit more skeptical uh, mm -hmm. of that one. Then again, I haven't seen it. And of course, I don't talk to uh, Kosomo, I don't talk to LACMA, but uh, I feel that, you know, in the light of us doing work and institutions like further field uh, doing work mm -hmm. before us in this yeah. field and uh, not getting credit ever. Um, mm -hmm. I feel on that, you know, this is an unrewarding work, uh, working on the, on, you know, historicizing, contextualizing, researching and uh, not making big numbers, uh, but, and not making big claims um, is incredibly important. Um, I, I do stand by, by, you know, by that, and that's why I build mm -hmm. my product, uh, but it's not necessarily recognized, uh, not even when it's very needed, like in the, the uh, in the context of an acquisition, um, you know, um, I feel that it's more of the same thing. Um, the gatekeepers are going to gatekeep. And, uh, you know, there's people that get prime access and uh, people that don't. Maybe it's a geographic location. Maybe it's about making big numbers and having big bags. bags. And, uh, yeah, I just uh, I just feel a little bit skeptical, um, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, uh, you know, I understood a little bit better the Pompey mm -hmm. one. Um, and I'm very excited, you know, Pompidou has done an amazing job at a show last year um, where they had Neil Balufa uh, NFTs as well. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, they're not no strangers um, yeah. to everything that's going on. Um, yeah. LACMA, you know, like, I think they should check the information that they supply to people because it's not looking uh, that it comes from a genuine interest. And it might be. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, it's very it's very convoluted right now. <laughs> uh, Peter, curious your opinion about this, you know, uh, recent um, news and and potentially a tendency. Uh, how do you well, feel about it? I think with over two billion screens in our pocket, the digitalization of digital art is inevitable. But at the same time, I think um, one of the area before we go any further in terms of development of this trend is ownership. Um, legitimate. I think we need clear understanding and definition of ownership. Um, authentication of artwork has become an important infrastructure piece of the whole ecosystem. The several issues that we're looking into, uh, talking to different people uh, in the art world is, how interoperable is all these between marketplaces? Um, does this authentication or ownership, is, does it have any legal standing in the court of human? And also the methods of authentication of digital art on chain and offline. Um, when we talk about people actually acquiring institution, actually uh, displaying, uh, putting that into the portfolio, I think there are important infrastructure pieces that we need to look into. And unfortunately, I think uh, at this point in time, um, the three issues that we've been, I've been talking about has not have any um, sufficient uh, advancement. Um, mm -hmm. We can buy a piece from a marketplace, but does it still apply in terms of all the terms and conditions in a separate marketplace? Um, okay. There are so many cases popping up in New York and London in terms of ownership of the NFT. And then, I mean, we used to have a piece of paper called certificate of authentication that we all trust and love. But nowadays, what do we do? Uh, there's, there's no standard there. So I think if we contribute to the conversation is, 
let's sit down together and define a way to work together between institution and organization about the definition of ownership. And then a technology that drives that ownership implementation. And then also <laughs> work with IP lawyers, uh, we might not like them, but they are the essential part of the, <laughs> the chain, the food chain, so that, so, so that everybody, when they look at a piece, when they want to buy it as an institution or as a, as a person, we know what we are buying and we know how ownership is being defined. And that's what we've been working on in the last nine months onwards. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a, uh, I mean, I'm somewhat privy to, I guess, some of the lead in process regarding the what's been happening at the, the Pompidou. But, you know, you often have these paradoxical situations where you have public institutions uh, who are legally not. Uh, allowed to own crypto, right? Because the the nation state to which they belong do, do not recognize uh, crypto as a legitimate currency, right? And, um, and so they cannot, you know, they certainly can't buy works in the traditional sense. So they have to, you know, essentially have to, at the moment, rely, I believe, on, on donations only. Then there's a question of, you know, where does that uh, work get sent? No. Uh, can an institution owner um, possess a wallet, right? Um, where does that wallet sit? Like all of these questions are, you realize that they are um, that completely up in the air at the moment. And that there, there seems to be very little concerted um, conversation, you know, between institutions. It's, you know, every time you talk to a specific institution, they're sort of battling at these philosophical questions by themselves it seems but um and it, it, it but at the same time there are and i would say i would stress here it's more it feels more like specific individuals at institutions rather than than the institution per se who feel for i often very good reasons that they want to begin to participate in this no that they want to that that, that, that this is important and that they don't want to wait 20 years, right? And then say, oh, okay, now we're gonna do it. Um, but there is, you know, there are these sort of competing timelines, it seems to me. Uh, and I agree with you, Peter, that there's, you know, that, that sort of sense of concerted protocols, uh, at, at, you know, at an institutional level um, would be very needed. Chris, over, over to you. I'm curious how you sort of responded to the, to the news and also to this mm -hmm. tendency in general, and I wonder whether you could relay to our audience where the, the sort of battle lines are in crypto t Twitter mm -hmm. or NFT Twitter regarding this topic. For sure. I mean, I think just to your, your most, most recent point from an infrastructural standpoint, uh, there is just a huge question at hand for digital conservation. And there there are no standards really across institutions. Everyone's doing their own sort of DIY uh, sort of compilation of best best practices for how to conserve work, and yeah. you know as we as we go along here, we have like early you know physical you know new media from from video to computational work to work that exists on older operating systems. How do you even store that? So let alone navigate yeah. um, wallet you know, regulatory frameworks with crypto custody, it's it's definitely, uh, I, I really feel for any sort of, anyone that has to deal with digital conservation and custody at any sort of institution, just because it's, it's a very complex situation um, for how these works will continue to live um, from his, you know, in a, from a historical perspective. But I think um, from a initial diffusion of, of this sort of digital art um, with these two institutions, I think it's a positive on the surface level because mm -hmm. I think there was a, a point in time when you would need a, a new media collector, like this is prior to NFT, NFT boom, um, and you'd be like, oh wow, I found a unicorn. Oh, you buy, you buy video work? Oh, you buy, uh, you know, it's just like they don't exist. Um, so I think with this NFT boom, we have an acceleration of this new sort of t collector base that is, you know, is open to buying digital works. And that sort of also, you know, crosses over into the, the institutional 
perspective where some of their patrons or or whatever or it's like okay let's let's not like miss out on this sort of situation and i think it's about time because um you know it, new media is is super neglected for the longest time uh you know a lot of friends in the space uh you either have to you know be exceptional and make it to some sort of google facebook residency or or a different sort of institutional path and those are few and far between and or you work in tech a lot of my new media, new media friends end up working in, in tech right and then you know, mm -hmm. you, you cross back and forth um, with their artistic practice. But I think from from like, uh, you know, with with regards to power and with regards to gatekeeping, like on from from the Twitter perspective, I haven't personally been following that conversation super, you know, uh, in, intensely. But I think from the most part, you know, there's two sides of it where you do see like, OK, cool, like there is some sort of institutional support and uh like you know seal of approval or whatever a lot of people mm -hmm. don't care i think the average nft trader does not care about lacma they don't know what pompidou is um, obviously you do have in that subsection of nft collectors in the art world yeah you do have people that you know know about that and know about the trad art sort of dynamics um but i think on and on the other end like mp was speaking to this where you know, you just have, you know, there's this red herring in crypto because sure, like some of these structures are, are decentralized, but, you know, power, you know, is still, you know, sequestered in the same way that any sort of network would, you know, sequester power. And I think in this situation, you know, with, with these institutions, um, you know, taking on acquisitions or donations, um, we have to question that and we have to question, you know, the works that are being acquired. Um, and it's important to to look at the broader spectrum because there's a lot of amazing work out there in the space, but they don't get the mm -hmm. time of day because, you know, we don't have, uh, you know, some NFT whale pumping their bags on Twitter. Um, you know, so I, I would say, like, it's I'm neutral with a mm -hmm. slight pause. I want to be optimistic, uh, but for the 5149. Yeah, fifty-one forty-nine. Yeah, so I, okay. it's it's good, but it's you know it comes with its its, its challenges as well. Yeah, well that that really leads me, I mean, seamlessly into the next um, question, uh, which is really about markets and um, you know as the adage uh, in the crypto space uh, goes, uh, we're still early. Uh, I mean, maybe there's a differentiation of just how early. How early, early, early uh, you you know we are, but it does feel like the legacy art world has doubled. I mean, what I've noticed, uh, and I felt this in a number of biennials, I feel it in art fairs, that um, that actually the legacy art world is is actually doubling down. They're not they're not necessarily, you know, opening the front door and letting everyone into the party. Almost the opposite, um, and they're actually doing what they they do best right which is um continue to fine tune and kind of instrumentalize this extremely well oiled engine uh that they did you know that they developed for uh at least a century if not not more at the same time you know if you read art, Bas art basel's market reports over the last couple of years there does seem to be uh it does seem to indicate a kind of growing interest from traditional collectors uh, towards new new kinds of digital art or, or NFTs or collectibles even. So I, I want to ask you uh, uh, whether you feel the convergence of markets is inevitable, unlikely, or even un unwanted. Uh, and MP, I'd like to start with you first, please. Um, I think it's unwanted. Um, I think mm -hmm. the, um, you know, I think the crypto market and the, uh, is tied to the NFT market, and the crypto market is very intricate and complex as it is. Um, it was also conceived as an alternative market. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all the, you know, the fact now is that when stocks go down, the crypto market as well goes down, and that is not good. Um, you know, we were, like, it was born as a defense mechanism. It shouldn't 
uh, it shouldn't continue to be a defense mechanism. It should continue to be its own thing. And uh, that applies as well to the NFT market. I think, um, and maybe tying again, like just bringing uh, us a little bit back to the previous question. Mm -hmm. No, I mm -hmm. want museum scene. I really want them in, mm -hmm. you know, I I want to have conversations. I want to learn from them. I want mm -hmm. to understand their best practices. And I'm sure the crypto market would under uh, would really, really benefit from understanding um the social codes, um, the different uh, fluctuations, the different trends in a traditional uh, art market. I uh, it's very interesting, it's also intricate and complex. And uh, there is a new uh, like a different layer. Uh, of addition where, you know, like social codes reign supreme and, and the NFT market feels like a lawless land, you know, there's not a, you know, social pressure against flippers, um, which I think it's a good thing, um, mm -hmm. you know, to have that social pressure on, you know, you're buying art. Um, you're not buying, you know, a, a random coin, you're buying art. Um, so, you know, we could learn from each other. Um, at the same time, I think that museums um, should experience the full Web three. They should get in. A, uh, they should get wallets. They should learn wallet best practices. They should get mm -hmm. in ENS. Um, for a museum to not have transferred the NFTs to a wallet, um, that's a red flag as well. Um, I understand that publicizing the wallet might bring a and what it spams and what it spam as well, but that's where the human layer comes in. And uh, both blockchain and the museums need the human layer. So you're you have a wallet, you have a a market, but you need you know human legitimacy and human communication to validate all of that. Um, so you know just to separate everything makes sense because um from a holistic perspective um uh, because we both need things from each other uh mm -hmm. but the truth is that the things are very complex and there's missing pieces on both both ends thank you peter i want to ask you then about i mean your your uh, uh, kind of approach to markets uh and whether this sort of sense of convergence i mean before we were talking about institutional kinds of convergence and of course these are interrelated but what what's your feeling here in terms of uh the convergence is it something inevitable or like mp is it unwanted um not sure i can answer that question but i think to answer that question we've got actually two different genre two different areas of um, discussion first of all yeah. is the creation of art um, I, we ran a exhibition online with a, a whole crew of women artists um, back in December. And when we started to do the creation, looking for artists, we find out that there are these people who actually have their root in the artists in, in fine art, and they're exploring different tools in the technology side. We call them artist coder. And mm -hmm. then there are a bunch of um, computer science graduates, PhD in animation from the tech side. We call them coder artists. Um, these people have different aesthetic. These people have different um, uh, aspiration for their creation. I mean, when I talk to one of the coder artists, uh, the high point of their creation is, oh, my database is not biased. I mean, that might not get a final artist excited, but to them, that's sort of like the eureka moment. So mm -hmm. if we are asking whether in the market, the artists are going to converge, my answer to that is no, it's not likely. Because it's always mm -hmm. going to be a art centric or a tech centric or art initiative and a, 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 a mm -hmm. tech initiative that is going to be very different in nature. Um, mm -hmm. Then I flip over to the collector side. Uh, we are familiar with uh, traditional art collectors, uh, visitors mm -hmm. of art collectors and galleries. I think they have their own framework of collecting, which is quite different from the newer generation. If you're talking about the active digital new generation art collectors, they're probably in their 30. They probably are very are much more tech savvy. Um, these people are data centric. They are very self-serve. They're very influenced by social network. So this bunch of people are very likely to be considering themselves to be more um, self-determined in their own ways. Um, not so much influenced by the writings of the, the canons of the 
uh, academics or, or, or the, the support of the traditional um, infrastructure. So I, I would look at it as one is in being influenced by this um, ecosystem being building around for a few hundred years. But a flip on the, the other side, the digital art collectors probably are going to be your tech savvy digital happy person. So in terms of collectors, I don't really see them mm -hmm. being urgent. Uh, but mm -hmm. then uh, with all these four matrix in the corners, um, is for people in the art industry, buying, selling, trading, to somehow create a way to serve them. I think that's the challenge for the art world to answer to. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's super interesting. Um, Chris, I'd sort of like to get your take on, on the sense of the inevitability of markets converging or whether as uh, actually both of our previous guests seem to suggest, there's uh, something about uh, actually insisting on uh, actually the opposite of that, perhaps. Well, I, I definitely think there's a new collector that has been created, right, in the last uh, three years. Um, whether or not, like, different collector types will converge is... I, I mean, like, you're going to get a Venn diagram, and I think you will get, obviously, some sort of convergence. You'll get some sort of Web3 uh, collectors that will start venturing into the other side and vice versa. Um, I, you know, I really think it depends on on the demographic of the collector and who's in their ear. Um, you know, I think you might have maybe an older, uh, you know, a more traditional collector that maybe listens to an advisor. Um, mm -hmm. depending on the advisor's taste, hopefully they have good taste, uh, you know, <laughs> and, but, you know, to Peter's point, actually, like you do have a lot of social bias towards collecting. And it, I think it's quite obvious too, in, in the games that we play with, with NFT collecting or PFP collecting, um, in, in web three. And, you know, you do have the same sort of dynamics of like, you know, maybe a, a cause and Murakami collector buying a board ape yacht club versus, uh, you know, maybe someone that's more nuanced and is buying a certain type of, uh, you know, I don't know, emerging artist um, out of somewhere versus, um, you know, really being influenced by, um, you know, what's hype. So, I mean, it's a hard question to answer. I don't think there's going to be convergence. There will be overlap. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there will be, you know, there'll be moments that will play together and stuff like that. But I think um, maybe from a long term perspective, uh, you could see a moment of like financialization in the sense that maybe NF, you know, NFTs become standard, uh, standard COA across galleries and stuff like that. And, you know, and I think that's you know, from that sort of three, four, five year trajectory where, you know, the use case of an NFT in terms of proof of ownership uh, is, you know, a low hanging fruit, right? Like mm -hmm. painting an NFT for my painting, you know, and that's great. You know, it's great archival practice and documentation. And, you know, we're starting to see galleries use this sort of uh, very standard approach to the technology. There might be a point where, certain galleries are like, well, our inventory is listed on this marketplace. And if you want to, you know, you can buy it. So there could be that moment in the future where uh, certain galleries do go full, uh, maybe we're not even called Web3. They're just saying like, well, our our inventory is listed on XYZ marketplace, on Blur, OpenSea, whatever. And I think that's where you could get a convergence where you do have like, the gallery holding the physical works and you know people could buy and sell it i mean maybe some of these galleries they want the liquidity they want the velocity uh of of these sort of markets to be applied to uh their own works and i think you know there is that sort of meme I, i'm pretty sure i heard this off new models where it was like blue chip collectors are like the og nft traders right because they're just <laughs> pulling up and buying off PDFs, and they're like, yo, yeah, cool, send that to my Singapore free port, send it to this free port, and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think maybe to go, you know, in a big circle, mm -hmm. um, in, a, in, a, in a longer time horizon, there could be convergence from more of a market and like sort of a, a technical standard perspective of adoption 
Um, so yeah. Great, thank you. And Clara, I mean, you're you're curating the Art Dubai digital space uh, at Art Dubai. It's the second year um, of this initiative. Uh, and the interesting thing, I think, about how that was set up by Chris last year was it is, um, if you look at the cast list, there is a, there's a mixture. You know, you, you, have, uh, you have traditional galleries that have pivoted to some extent towards this new space. You have galleries that have only ever dealt in that. And there are, some of them are bricks and mortar, some of them aren't. And then you've also had DAOs and other more kind of experimental communities like NFT Asia or CyberBat. And I mean, how do we read something like Art Dubai in terms of this idea of convergence? Yeah, I think with Art Dubai Digital, you know, I think we're very much attempting at least a bringing together of sorts to, you know, and we do see, and I have to say kudos to Chris and the fair directors for their kind of forward thinking, open mindedness mm -hmm. that um, as a fair, we're not just working with brick and mortar galleries, but, you know, we've also opened the section up to actually think about yeah. how do you reflect, you know, in a traditional art fair setting of a cultural infrastructure and ecosystem that's actually being challenged and shifting. So, you know, you see sort of um, galleries that have been operating for decades, collaborating with brand new kind of wet three based entities. Um, we have a collector fund, 6929 fund, um, that's, um, you know, a minor sponsor and actually exhibiting works from their collection as part of the section. So you do see that, you know, on, I think both sides of the coin, there is this, um, at least from, you know, some of the players, there is this willingness and want um, to bridge, to think about how different art worlds can come together. How can we speak to each other? How do we work on this translation to then, you know, hopefully better both parts of the ecosystem? I think as MP was also trying to get at. Um, but sort of in my um, own work prior to, well, this month, I was also running a space in Singapore um, that was mm -hmm. very much kind of in this traditional art world. Um, and, you know, I would interact with a lot of collectors from this traditional art space, and they're very curious and interested that you know they want to know is there anything interesting in the nft space that i need to get to know are there any artists you would recommend that i look at um but i think in order to actually you know have someone um from that kind of background become very interested or even embedded it someday in this ecosystem is still a very long way to go and i don't know if that's you know even something that we're really pushing for um but mm -hmm. on the flip side of the coin I do see a lot of collectors from that like crypto whale trader, um, you know, background that's actually starting to get really curious about what the work is about. Um, if I'm building out, you know, an NFT collection, what do I mm -hmm. think about? How can I get to know more curators who can tell me, you know, what to sort of look for? Um, I'm also um, sort of part of the networks of this DAO called Glimmer DAO. That's a new collector DAO that's thinking about collecting Asian art. Right. And we're really sort of trying to think about how can we build out the most important collection in this space, you know, that focuses on Asian art. And when you think about it from that perspective, it's not necessarily so different from maybe what collectors have always been thinking about in the wider art market. But at the same time, I think echoing some of, you know, my fellow panelists sentiments, I don't know if that full convergence is really something that um, I personally want. Because I do mm -hmm. hope, you know, with this opening up um, of the art world, the art ecosystem, that there can still be different pockets, different intentions for why, you know, we're thinking about art for at least this expendedness of thinking about where art can fit in in our lives, um, different possibilities that an art object can take up, um, or even what the role of a curator can be. I think all of these questions that you know have really come up in the past couple of years because of NFTs and blockchain have at least sort of for me helped keep me actively in check of like, what am I doing in this space and who are the artists I'm supporting and in what ways um, am I going to perpetuate you know, the, the problems we've always talked about or do I have an opportunity here to actually create a culture that I think can be more open and creator-centric or artist-centric. So I guess, yeah, just sum it all up. 
even though mm -hmm. there is sort of want to bridge. And I think that's great. But I do hope some of these structures can remain separate. Amazing. Um, we've got about five, seven minutes left. If there are any questions, please can you type it in the Q&A box and I will I'll get to it. Um, uh, I did want to discuss AI, but we don't have time and I think it's fine. But what I do really want to um, uh, uh, touch on um, is uh, a uh, how you all feel about um, where we're going next um, and uh, outlook in, in general. Uh, I have a, uh, a, a new lexicon, it's called the Lexicon of Law Corps, uh, that's coming out on Zora Zine, hopefully later this week or next week. And one of my neologisms is uh, agnostimistic, which is a, uh, a fusion of ag agnostic and optimistic. Uh, and it's neither optimistic nor pessimistic, but a secret third thing. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, uh, I mean, I may be a, a self-styled doomer, uh, so I'm, I'm quite biased, but sometimes it feels increasingly like hope is one of the scarcest resources we have today. Um, but I wanna ask you, uh, uh, each of you, what you're hopeful about most in the short and long term, um, either you know specifically in something that you're you're, you're doing your, yourself or or something um, you know in a broader broader sense. Um, Peter, um, what are you hopeful about? Oh, sorry, we can't hear you. Oh, you're muted. So. Um... Yeah. To start that, I want to share a quote with you from the CEO of Apple, mm -hmm. Tim Cook. Mm -hmm. he, he was saying, I don't understand what metaverse is. I think the velocity of innovation is just too quick, fast, and in, immersive. Um, in order to actually connect with anything, we should be more prudent in terms of what and how and why we want to connect with that. That's why I think what we do at our think tank is we we're concerned and we're investigating a lot about the identity of things, the identity of art, the identity of collectors, the identity of the artists. I mean, without knowing the identity of all these, how do we engage with them? So um, coming forward, we would put a lot of effort into uh, talking to different people in the industry, try to figure out the eat of each of these entities and trying to get to the bottom of the most intrinsic and primitive um, understanding of what they really are before we engage. And I think, um, although we are so-called in a in a, in a, in a crypto winter, but the first generation bubble is always good. I mean, that's when the actual innovation and actual infrastructure gets built. And I want to see if we can all help contribute to the infrastructure infrastructure of knowledge by understanding the identity of all these things that we are trying to engage with before we go any further. That's what my mm -hmm. think for the next near future. Amazing. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, MP. What are you hopeful about? Um, what we're building, actually. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, not only what JPEG is building, but what uh, other communities uh, adjacent to JPEG are building, and we are all contributing together, including Clara and and Chris, that uh, are mm -hmm. part of you know my uh, my closer NFT community is worthwhile. It's important. Uh, it's useful, um, so I'm hopeful about us, uh, you know, continuing to grow. I'm hoping, uh, I'm hopeful about us uh, building through the bear and not only surviving the bear because that's, you know, that's a, like that's minutia, but actually, you know, making sure that what we're building through the bear um, mm -hmm. has a future in a high, high hype environment in the next bull market where opportunity costs for uh, exploring uh, in. Um, in exchange for exploring culture is actually very high. So people tend to not do it. Um, right now, people have more time and they love to do it. Um, so I'm hopeful about all of those uh, meaning making uh, infrastructure builders. Um, and I'm a little bit less hopeful about uh, the wider crypto market and about the wider NFT market because we live in an age of grifters and pathological liars that are taking a lot of the spotlight. True that. Um, Chris, sources for your hope 
in the coming future? 2022, everything is a scam. Uh, but um, what I'm hopeful for, I mean, in the crypto sense, um, I'm, yeah, there's a lot of people building stuff right now. And there's a lot of things happening. There's people that are still active. And there's yeah. a lot of interesting narratives uh, being constructed in, you know, from NFT infrastructure perspective, uh, where there's like loan, you know, loan platforms uh, being built where you can take a pudgy penguin or whatever and get loan to value on that. That's that's fascinating. I hope that sort of that sort of infrastructure gets keeps developing, um, mm -hmm. you know, despite prices and stuff like things are are. Finally, you know, this, you know, after a year of down only, um, you know, this quarter has been quite uh, nice. And I think, um, yeah, I mean, from a general perspective, though, um, I, I'm just hoping for more uh, love in the tropics. So this this mm -hmm. sort of music project I'm working on with Obese Dogma, uh, you know, also shout out to, to Gabber Modus Operandi in Indonesia. There's like a really interesting moment here with. Um, you know, grassroots electronic music genres in the space. And I think I'm speaking more uh, broadly on a cultural level too, but um, just seeing more synergies in the region and building off each other's sort of uh, vibe and energy and like sort of, you know, contributing into in, in that sort of direction where there's just more, I guess, you know, from a contemporary standpoint, uh, more more openness to be self-referential and 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 sort of su supportive of our own, you know, local, but also regional communities as well. But yeah, you know, I mean, day by day, as they say here in, in Italy, piano, piano. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing, thank you. Um, actually, Clara, there's a question that's come in and I think you might be a good person to talk about this. How do we think about the presentation of digital art are the hardware screens keeping up? I mean, perhaps my my interpretation of that would be that you know there um, sometimes the the exhibiting of NFT based art can be a um, uh, an underwhelming experience because you know you get in we, we sort of enter into this world of TV screens on walls um, you know and there's literally a kind of flattening of uh, uh, of a, a viewing experience, um, where 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 are things at in terms of you know the, both the curating and the displaying of uh, of this sort of this sort of work? Yeah, um, I think you know in the first year and months um, we were seeing a lot more of sort of these kinds of presentations and showcases really where it was like. You needed a couple NFT things on the screen. And so, you know, you pull it up and you really treat it as content. And you're really just thinking about like, how can I have some NFTs in this event? Um, I think that, you know, was acceptable in the beginning because we were all just mm -hmm. rushing to sort of make something happen. We didn't know better. Artists didn't know they could ask for more. But we're sort of at this turning point where people are starting to become much more critical of how, you know, works are being shown, how they're being contextualized and set up. Um, I've worked on a couple of shows um, focusing on kind of artworks minted as NFTs in Singapore. And my approach has always been that, like, it's no different from, well, a regular show. You know, you're just thinking of a very different kind of context or thinking of a different kind of technology. And in some cases, even a different medium. Um, but I think we can also look back onto decades of histories of, you know, great media art shows, digital shows yeah. in general that have come before this moment and consider if we're bringing digital artworks into the physical space, um, how are we enriching, you know, that experience with the work? I think if someone goes to a show and they're like, oh, this works actually looks a lot better online, then you know, the curator didn't do a very good job. Um, but I guess on the note of like technology or kind of art and tech, Chris and I were having this conversation recently. Um, mm -hmm. And again, a plug, I guess, for art to buy digital is we're actually seeing sort of, you know, a lot more diversity, a lot more possibilities for the kind of technology that's developing around displaying art, not just kind of screens or like, you know, easier display kind of protocols or mechanisms, but 
people really thinking about kind of room size setups, multi, you know, sensory kind of installations or AR and VR becoming more and more common as ways of experiencing digital art and bridging sort of physical and digital realities. So I think we're at this moment in which, you know, we're going to start to see more sort of immersive possibilities in physical spaces engaging with digital artworks. Um, so that's something I'm quite hopeful about, the fact that people are asking these questions and mm -hmm. hoping for better. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we we have run out of time. My my apologies to my guests who I know I know you set up lovely slideshows. Um, but I uh, you know greedily took the opportunity to um, try and push this into a more of a conversational direction. I hope I hope that's okay with you. Um, uh, apologies to audience who were you know uh, looking uh, uh, to see more 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 images, but I, I hope you'll agree each of our guests are incredibly handsome and beautiful and uh, more aesthetically pleasing than any uh, slideshow could ever be. Um, so a, a deep thanks to Clara, to Chris, to Peter, to MP. Really, really appreciate um, your amazing insights, your um, also your frankness, your honesty. Um, it, it counts for a lot. Um, everybody who's tuned in now or will tune in the future, thank you so much. Your attention is very uh, appreciated. Uh, thanks again to the team uh, at Art Basel Hong Kong and the team at, at Art Dubai. If you're coming out to Dubai, we hope to see you. And um, for me, Shuman Basar, good morning, good afternoon, good night, and goodbye. Bye. <laughs>